So welcome everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to this panel on the on decommodification following on the heels of the plenary roundtable on decommodification. Uh, I'm Robin Bergis, the Interim Director of Grants and Advocacy at the Economic Justice Program of the Open Society Foundations. And we are here to discuss which forms of work do we need to de decommodify most urgently and why. The issue of the degree to which individuals can maintain a standard of welfare independent of market participation. That is, of what kinds of labor should be left to the market and what kinds should not, has become quite politically salient today and have been increasingly since the crises of the re recent past. So ever since the austerity that followed the financial crisis, the attention to rising inequality, and now COVID, we've been confronted with issues of essential services and public provision. National stimulus and recovery plans to build back better, for example, proposals to build in better infrastructure, but things like care and the need to recognize care work on the agenda. These debates about decommodified services and goods invite discussions about decommodification of the work that provides them. And the, these succeeding crises also keep raising the same set of questions that orient us to the purposes of decommodification as well. So we're here to explore a few things, among them issues like when and where are the outcomes of markets harmful to the welfare of the agency of workers and people? When and where do they undermine social equality? Once upon a time in the past, it wasn't just questions of the economy, but questions of participation in society and the polity that were implicated in the question of decommodification. If these forms of work should not be left to the market, what should they be left to? And as Dorothy Ghosh also highlighted in the plenary earlier today, how should we address the needs not only to decommodify, but also recognize workers in this process, especially those who are unrecognized, those who, for example, provide care work. So to help us think about these issues and more, we have three very distinguished and inspiring panelists. We have with us Deborah Satz, the Martha Sutton Weeks Professor of Philosophy and by courtesy political science at Stanford University. She's also the Dean of the Humanities and Social and the Dean of the School of Humanities and Sciences. And her books include Why Some Things Should Not Be For Sale, The Moral Limits of Markets, and Economic Analysis, Moral Philosophy and Public Policy. We also have with us June Carbone, the Rabina Chair of Law, Science and Technology at the University of Minnesota Law School. She's the author of Red Families Versus Blue Families and as well as mar marriage markets, how inequality is remaking the American family. And we have with us Myrtle Whitboy, a South African labor activist and general secretary of the South African Domestic Service and Allied Workers Union, as well as the first president of the International Domestic Workers Federation, where she helps lead the, and in South Africa, she helps lead the fight for a national minimum wage increase and compensation for on the job injuries for domestic workers. She has helped secure the passage of the ILO Convention on Decent Work for Domestic Workers, the first international labor standard to ensure domestic workers the same basic rights as others. And so with that, I will turn it over to Deborah as our first panel participant. I, I think we were going to start with Myrtle, but now that she's here. Oh, okay. Sorry. We'll start with Myrtle. Myrtle, over to you. Uh, good day. Uh, good, e good evening, good afternoon, uh, I'm Myrtle, and um, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, when you were talking to me about, or talking to me about decommunication of domestic workers, you know, a lot of things went and through my mind, and a lot of things and actions of domestic workers that we've done over the years. And I'm not a, actually a person that, that speaks on paper, but I had to make some notes so that I don't lose track of what I actually want to bring across. But but in, what we actually have to realize is that although domestic workers in, in actual constitute a large presentation of the working force and the global network, we also have to understand that only 10% are maybe covered with labor laws or 10% have some protection. But we also, if they are protected, we also have to understand that many of that labor laws are practically on papers and it's not implemented for domestic workers, largely because the lack of governments or the lack of labor departments. And for us to understand 
you know the word, the full meaning of the word. We have to understand that domestic workers are actually like their own by employers. Domestic workers are actually, you know, sex slaves. Domestic workers are migrated from the one country to another country. My therefore, domestic workers, for them, if we look at this communication, it means that poverty, helplessness, and, and, and the lack and forced labor, and, you know, and, and their passport, handing in their passport, restriction of freedom of movement. And that is also, they are forced to triple exploitation, and domestic work is basically women's work. Poor women's work, and, and, and operate by black women in South Africa, and in the world, it is migrant workers. And then, of course, if you look at the concept of domestic work, our jobs include care work, child minding, and often security, but yet we are subject to low minimum wages. Yet we are subject to the lowest minimum wage. And that is why if we also, if we look at the UN, what is the, what is the union? What is the eight basic facts that the UN nation has put out? They say that it's housing or shelter education, health, food, water, and all that is supposed to be the basic right of workers. Now, let me, let me start to look, why do we think we need to de the section? Firstly, we need to put profit last and people before profit. That is the first thing. And how do we go about it? I think we have to be basic of the principle of work, of equal value, and it should be the understanding that domestic work is valuable work, no different from other work. It should be based that domestic work is essential to allow employers to be part of the economy and for domestic workers to remain active in the inside of the house. It provides equality to the outside for the employer to add to the economy. Yet, when it comes to the economy, we are not profitable. Yet, when it comes to economy, we are not recognized. Therefore, we need to reorganize our thinking of society that needs to see workers, people are more important than profits. It will also give them the satisfaction of our domestic workers that we are part of the larger society to contribute to our lives, to be valued, and to ensure that domestic work also are compensated that will restore our dignity and pride in the world. So this is how we see this. We see this that domestic workers, because of all our lack of freedom and because of, you know, sometimes you find the employers has, has got a rule like they own us. We belong to them. And there's my favorite one that they say, you know, you are part of the family. We are not part of their family. We've never been part of the family. We work for them. And to work for them, we need to get recognition. But because they are so selfish, they think when they get us in the house, all they do is they start to own us. They start to tell us what to do. They start to tell us how to think. But yet, we are free up here, and we've got our own minds. And that is why we have to now push governments to give recognition that our work should be recognized as work, that our work should be decent work. And, and, and I think that is, I'm not sure if we went off now. Ari, am I still on? Hello? You are, you're still on. Oh, okay. yes, we so we have to do we have to ensure that our work is so that oh that we will get recognition for it. It's going to be a long task. It's gonna be a long way to get the employees to get rid of that that I owe you, you belong to me, I've got your passport in my hand, you can do nothing. So it is time the government start giving social protection for domestic workers. It's time that the government start protecting us as domestic workers. And it's time beyond the minimum wage for us to be able to have access to housing and to everything out there. We need to be able to earn a decent living wage or a decent minimum wage. And for us to know that we are part of the economy, we need to get that recognition. So for us, Decommunation of domestic workers means recognize us, give us rights, and for government to actually, you know, ensure 
that we get away from poverty and that we become part of the broader section. Thank you so much. Thank you, Myrtle. Uh, the, the, the challenges of uh, the need to be recognized to receive protections, both social and legal, really speak to the heart of many of these issues. Um, over to you, Deborah. Yeah, thanks. And I'm going to, I hope, uh, follow up uh, in a little bit more abstract way, but pick up some of the themes that uh, Myrtle was, um, was uh, highlighting. I want to uh, just start by noting uh, no form of work can be com completely commodified. Human beings are just different than widgets or things. Um, we can resist employers by working slow, organizing collectively, exiting, engaging in sabotage. Norms also affect uh, the, um, the organization of work, human norms, including sexist norms, for example, that have led domestic workers to be treated quite differently than you know, what are seen as market workers, even though, of course, domestic workers are um, market workers. And finally, there are uh, measures that can be taken and are usually taken outside the labor market that um, can insulate workers from the worst forms of commodification. Uh, there are measures that increase worker bargaining power. There are measures that make it easier for workers to exit from uh, exploitative relations, uh, but countries around the world differ in their labor standards and their degrees of unionization, the freedoms that they offer. And around the world, in every country, we leave many workers vulnerable to abuse, neglect, and servitude. And I'm going to focus just for a second on the United States, not because I think we're unique <laughs> uh, among nations, or, but because it's what I know best. And I'll just use it to illustrate some of the themes, and this will resonate with uh, some of what Myrtle was talking about. So just think for a second about life in uh, one of America's largest employers, uh, Amazon. So Amazon workers are timed to the second uh, in their shifts. Uh, their uh, employees are tagged with personal satellite navigation computers that tell them, uh, the uh, managers, the route that the workers are uh, following, whether they're uh, you know, taking a second too long they track which bathrooms they use when they go to the bathroom. And if they don't use the bathroom that's closest, they can be fired. Um, they, um, uh, if they fall short of targets, they're fired. And it's only when journalists exposed working conditions at a Amazon center in Lehigh, where the temperature had reached 102 degrees that, and where the, it was so hot that the company had an ambulance ready to take workers to the hospital. It's only after journalists reported on this that Amazon installed air conditioning. So that's a condition of extreme commodification. And I just wanna point out some of the um, aspects of it. So the workers at Amazon have no voice um, in the conditions of their work, no representation, no ability um, uh, for, uh, to uh, engage with management on the terms of their work. Many of them are very poorly paid uh, and in uh, communities without lots of alternatives, so they have no real ability to exit. There's no power to strike a better deal. Their replacement by machines and by other workers is a uh, constant possibility. And they're basically treated as appendages to machines, not as human beings should be treated, but as simply inserting themselves into a process where they're another part. And if they break down, the ambulance will take them to the hospital and somebody else will step in. So a big message here is um, that treating people at as appendages to machines and treating them as uh, disposable is an insult to self-respect. It's a 
failure of society to ensure the conditions of self-respect for its members. Uh, it is a form of servitude in, a, in many societies that um, in their political organization are committed to non-servitude or to freedom. So it's a fatal flaw. Um, and I wanna, um, so it's real, and it's really bad for uh, human well being, the well being of families, for equality of opportunity, for many social values. I just want to close quickly by pointing out uh, one other factor. So this points us to the more these factors like um, no power to strike a better deal, no voice, risk to health, the higher those scores are, the more urgent decommodification is. But there's another factor that I think we need to think about when we think about um, the importance of voice at work. And that's a um, democratic effect of being treated as an appendage at work. And there's a lot of interesting research now that shows that people who are treated as machine parts at work um, are less likely to engage politically are less likely to feel empowered to stand up for their rights. And that this is also a problem for our democracy, for any democracy. Um, and it's something that I think really needs to be um, uh, paid attention to that a lot of the most vulnerable workers also uh, tend to be isolated from the political process and not feel it as a as a home or as a place where they um, uh, can make a difference. And that suggests that decommodifying work is not only important for treating people with respect, but it's also um, uh, important for how we live together and how our political institutions function. And I'll, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. I think we'll return to this question of the relationship between between uh, voice in society and, and in the polity itself, as well as and how it relates to recognition and voice at work. Um, over to you, June. Okay. Well, thank you. This is terrific. Um, and I come at this, I may be the odd person out, I come at this from family law. And so I've spent a lifetime looking at what happens to the family. And I, I got interested in the relationship with work. I started going to marriage movement type meetings. Uh, and they were decrying the, the loss of marriage. And to meetings on the left that said marriage is an old fashioned institution. We don't need it. And neither group wanted to talk about the relationship to economic change. And when I started digging, um, the, the takeaway was that instability in income was at least as pernicious in undermining families as unemployment. And I started thinking about this, where does this idea of instability, how do we, and insecurity, and how do we think about it? And you go back and you look historically, and the rise of wage labor is intrinsically insecure. And there's a whole movement, the birth of the male family wage, with Henry Ford having 375% turnover in 1915. And the, the crea and, and by the post-war era, the creation of really a three-legged stool. Um, the union movement, employers who needed stable workforces, and government that built in protections into the workplace, depending on stable employment. And that system's gone. And so the question I ask is, who are the right partners to bring back the kind of basic stability in income that allows workers to feel some degree of security to plan their lives? And the conclusion, I could give you chapter and verse on Supreme Court decisions that have undermined uh, the role of employers as partners. I don't think we should think of employers as partners. I think what we need is a form of organization that takes place outside of individual workplaces. And that does the following things. First, you need to reset labor markets. So one of the things that's going on right now is that with COVID, 
with payments for COVID, with lack of health care, <laughs> with all those domestic workers not being so available, um, is you're seeing a change in labor markets that puts pressure on employers without there being any formal change in anything. With Uber and Lyft, you see organizations, the creation of union-like activities outside of individual workplaces. But fundamentally, what you need to do is to rethink the power of the state. That is, the state is providing basic security. If you had guaranteed income, you had a job guarantee, you had retraining programs, resettlement programs, flex security European style, you know, that looks at the question, how do you address the transition between jobs in terms of retooling? That would also reset labor markets and put pressure on employers who would have a harder time hiring people. So I think of it as a fundamental rethinking. And a final point as to how this fits together. I spent a lot of time looking at gender. And we're writing a book called Shafted, <laughs> a Women Lose in a Winner Take All Economy. And it's looking at the increase in the gendered wage gap for college graduates at the top of the economy. And the squeezing of workers who tend to be overwhelmingly women at the bottom of the economy. But where's the middle? When you look at the middle and you say, where is job growth occurring? It's healthcare, education, old age, uh, a lot of the domestic workers that Myrtle is talking about. That's where the greater demand is. And all of those things depend on public spending. They're not free market. <laughs> you know, there's no free market for healthcare. Uh, you, you would devastate the entire healthcare economy if you eliminated the government subsidization that underlies it. And it makes no sense to attach uh, health insurance to work. Um, what you want is universal health care independent of specific jobs. That requires public uh, a public infrastructure. So you have a public infrastructure for education, for health care, for old age, uh, and, and the care work is associated with that. But what you don't have is a form of worker organization that is active in the political sphere. Teachers unions, and note how much conservative politicians love to villainize teachers unions, and even teachers, when budget cuts are on the table. Um, but teachers unions don't just organize in individual schools for better conditions for teachers. They're a political force with pressures on public spending. And so, to conclude, I think the issue is instability of employment, you need greater security, which in turn resets labor markets. To get it, you need a new state public partnership, and it's got to be a state citizen partnership, not a state employer partnership on the corporate elitist model that existed in the middle of the 20th century. And you need to be attentive to the question, where are the jobs of the future coming from? They come from public expenditures. The private sphere is busy automating all of us and replacing us with algorithms, including lawyers, I might add. And, um, and so to rethink the future of work, you have to rethink it in global terms, not simply individual workplaces. Thank you so much, Jim. And this question of the politics of it all where the political power behind this comes from and what yeah. comes first and how can we use policy to build power, build, use power to build policy, I think speaks to much of the heart of it. We have a question in the chat, but before we take, um, before we go to it, um, I want to ask, I want to follow on the uh, uh, something that Myrtle raised earlier and which Deborah touched on as well, which is many of these sectors are characterized by labor that's not recognized or made visible. It's often stigmatized in many ways. And so, and then this question of, um, it seems to me there's a difference between, especially some forms of labor which are semi-commodified or uncommodified and labor that's decommodified. One comes from a position of recognition and elevation, the other does not. How do we leverage concerns about the latter, about uncommodified or semi-commodified labor? And to leverage that, to move that into the space, and I guess this touches on some of what June was, had raised about um, mm -hmm. sectors where there's hope for connections between 
public provision of certain kinds of goods, which are now uh, uh, where, where the labor forces are not quite attached in that, uh, empowered in that public provision or that public subsidy. So, um, so just the question on the politics of that. I'm happy to <laughs> jump in and start. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure this is, you know, I'm trying to um, see if I follow the, the question. I mean, I think part of the politics, and you heard this theme in, um, in I think what everyone says maybe came out uh, most uh, uh, strongly in June's comments is, you know, we have to do things outside the workplace uh, as well as inside the workplace. There's a lot of the action is outside the workplace. A lot of the recognition and the rights have to be um, uh, uh, um, secured outside the workplace. You change conditions in the workplace by changing the fallback position of workers. If people know that they can leave their employment without losing their livelihoods and their health insurance and um, uh, their well-being of themselves and their families, that does a lot to uh, uh, help change the position of, of workers at work. But we also have to do things inside the workplace, I think, because um, it's not sufficient to have higher, uh, you know, to ha it helps uh, enormously to have these um, other parts in place. But if you still treat people at work with abuse, without voice, um, as appendages to machines, the, you're, you're undercutting some of what the, um, uh, the, the state has to reach in mm -hmm. to the workplace as well. We recognize that with sexual harassment laws and other um, you know, forms of reaching in, but I actually think we need to reach in and make sure that workers have some voice in their employment relations, that they um, have the ability to say, like, this isn't a good way to do this, or too many people are getting hurt here. Um, and that's why I think unions have a really important role to play um, and labor, organized labor power has a role to play in advancing um, what we're calling decommodification or un uh, what you were calling uncommodification. Yeah. <laughs> Can I say that to you? Yeah, I think that in, in domestic work, it's a very difficult situation because domestic workplace is in the home. And in the home, they are actually as prisoners in that very home that they work in. And because they are migrant workers, they have migrated from one country to the, that country. So they actually, in actual fact, to be brought in, they become slaves in that home. They actually have no outside life because anything happens in that home. They work in that home, they stay in that home. And I think that, that, that is the, the difficult part that we have. And like you were saying, that trade unions must play a bigger role. Yes, but if you find the labor law is restricting something, you know, that unions can play a bigger role because the labor law restricts unions from going into the workplaces without permission. And then we also have to see that the restrictions of the labor law and the restrictions of the domestic workers in the workplace also neglect a family where she comes from. So it's an expectation of both ways. Yeah. Can I jump in? Please, please do. So I, I've spent a lot of time looking at things like enforcement of sex discrimination, sexual harassment laws. And the thing that you find is that you need private actors with an incentive to make this work. So you look at workplaces. Where do women do best? Where there's unionization. Unionization is critical to enforcing um, uh, anti-discrimination, anti-sexual harassment laws. If you don't have unions, even if you have the laws on the books, they don't get enforced. And then you ask the question, well, how do you address the issues Myrtle was talking about? And, you know, for a while I was looking at things like the EU and being enthused by the idea, well, 
even though the EU is an enormous bureaucracy, uh, you know, uh, poor parts of Europe thought, wow, we gained economically, we want to be part of it. To be part of it, we've got to comply with a variety of labor protections, etc. I see all of that as being undermined. But it was true in the US too. I mean, it was, the civil rights enforcement was a ticket of admission for the South into the most prosperous economy in the world. Now, now the South is having its revenge and, and turning the labor conditions in the South and the racism in the South uh, is spreading throughout the rest of the US. But when you ask the question, you've got to want to be part of something. I think on the domestic front, we need recognition that things like early childhood education, healthcare, nursery schools, uh, the whole nine yards for early childhood and for senior citizens are public responsibility. Then if you have public provision of the funding, you also tend to get public regulation. If it's up to, you know, if it's up to me to hire somebody to take care of my father when he was dying. I'm not going to be able to treat that worker as well as a government agency that supplies workers to provide that kind of assistance. Thank you. I think we've lost Myrtle for the moment. Um, and so I will jump to this, the second question in, in the chat. Um, so it's a question for all of you. Uh, so which is much of the, much, much of decommodification appears from basically in the public just sort of understanding some of the challenges, the limits, and there's like an awareness issue, right? Um, the information about Amazon having gone, for example, a long way to start shifting Amazon in certain directions. So the question is, what are some, uh, some ways in which we can build sort of like wider awareness about the role that decommodification can play. And I'm going to build on this a little, which is the political, you know, from a policy framework, we know what the state can do. Organizing is of course, in many ways to force the state to do it, right? It's, uh, it's tied to the political economy of policy. The challenges that, that I think June you touched on or Deborah, perhaps you both touched on it, of atomized workers or uh, unaware individuals, right? So, which create like different kinds, it's a different kind of economy, an economic structure than say what built the welfare states at the end of World War II with strong union movements and large decommodifying social safety nets. What does today's look like? I'm happy to take a stab. Uh, you know, I, I found reading Piketty's book on inequality um, incredibly informative and depressing. And there's a, he has a line in there where he said it took two world wars and the Great Depression to uh, curtail uh, the excesses of industrial capitalism. And when I look at it, gee, how did unions gain power the last time around? Uh, Franklin Roosevelt understood it was a necessary part of the New Deal coalition. That helped in the 30s but it was World War II. And World War II, the federal government took the position, we're not gonna put war plants, you know, lots of job creation. We're not gonna put them in your district unless you're pro-union, you know, unless you have the right kind of labor protections. That's incredibly powerful. And that stayed in place after World War II. We don't have anything like that going on now. You know, a crisis is a good thing to waste. Uh, I think uh, federal government should have gone after Wall Street following the great financial crisis and didn't. And the failure to do so we're living with. I mean, you know, the power has moved to Google instead of uh, Goldman Sachs, but it, you, you, you have to curtail the power that is undermining the system. And I think you need a counterpoint of mobilization. So I've been looking at the job guarantee versus guaranteed income. You know, the job guarantee, modern monetary theory talks about it. They talk about it as a countervailing fiscal measure. But I think it's more important as a point of community building and organization. Get a job guarantee and anybody who loses their job can get another job and that builds in job training. You now have a focal point for organization. And for that reason, the right will oppose it to 
tooth and nail last ditch effort. But I think those are the terms we have to be thinking of. What's the focal point for organization? Right now it's the suburbs. <laughs> my, my conservative Republican neighbors <laughs> are appalled by Trump. <laughs> you know, the business types, the well-educated business types. Mm. Um, but if they were threatened, you know, with a global meltdown, they suddenly would tolerate a democratic administration. And you got to sneak this stuff through. Um, that's what I think you need. Yeah, there, there's a depressing message embedded in that. Uh, you know, and, uh, I have a colleague, Walter Scheidel, who also wrote a book on inequality. And like, is if you really care about equality, you should want a famine and a depression and a world war. And that's not a great winning program for us. But I, I do think I, I, I'm also a big fan of the idea of jobs uh, guarantee and trying to um, do things that will improve the position of workers you know again just taking the united states as a because i know that i mean we have so um uh uh, uh you know def you know basically put labor in the most subordinate position that we can by taking away every possible legal protection and legal, uh, mm -hmm. you know, making unionizing incredibly hard and difficult. So I think that's important. I do think there is a role for investigative journalism. Maybe I'm a, a bit optimistic here, and I, but I do think some of these exposures, people really don't know a lot of, I mean, and particularly the wealthier parts of the income distribution really don't know a lot about the lives of others. And many societies now we are so segmented and so segregated that, you know, along racial and class lines that we know little about the lives of others. And I think investigative reporting can, can actually put some pressure mm -hmm. Right and and help workers um, as it did in the Amazon case and unfortunately our world right now investigative reporting is under a lot of pressure by um, you know the rise of the internet and uh, you know new mo you know it's been hard to get a new model for uh, uh, professional news but I I think that's that is probably one piece of it but I I like you know I think. Anything we can do that can increase, you know, strengthen the fallback position um, is very important. Right. So I had I had another question, unless there are others in the chat, which I do, um, there was a question for Myrtle, actually, which we can also explore. Um, there's, you know, um, when it comes to some some kinds of work care work, we're looking at a global movement, mm -hmm. right? So these are increasingly denationalized in many ways, both, I mean, certainly um, there's lots of inspiration and learning is across, across, across different societies. And, um, and increasingly some of the, some of the sector, like uh, uh, sort of the, some parts of the labor for when you think about healthcare or teachers, there's an increasing uh, practice of bargaining for the common good, solidaristic demands across as a way of building solidarities mm -hmm. and coalitions. How can these efforts be supported or or um, highlighted as a way of uh, of improving the working conditions of say domestic workers or similarly posi positioned workers worldwide? Well, I think one of the issues we need to look at is identity. So again, what's so depressing is that the way in which, um, you know, even Democrats like Bezos gain power over workers is through a movement. Um, Hacker and Pearson have a new book called Let Them Eat Tweets. And <laughs> the thesis of the book is that basically the fat cats fund <laughs> the activation of an identity based on a combination of racism, resentment, of uh, you know feelings that are uh, anti-elite kinds of feelings, uh, that then empowers um, 
the Catholics. And when you think about how that identity is created, the role of Fox News is the most powerful entity in the United States right now. Um, and Facebook, of course, is playing its pernicious role as we are discovering. Um, so both of them operate in tandem to produce this locked-in identity that is impervious to this kind of information. There are these great studies of people in rural Pennsylvania that indicate you know, they're, they, they, they're quite articulate on the subject about how their bosses are ripping them off, how rich people control the economy, how there's nothing in it for them, and Democrats and Republicans are just the same, so why bother to vote? And that's the message that has been so effectively sold to workers, and they bought into, at least white workers, in more rural parts of the country. And when you ask the question, where is the counter identity of that? Um, on the one hand, there's certainly a racialized counter-identity. But I think the problem is that people like William Barber, who runs the Poor People's Campaign, and when I listen to him, I think, oh yeah, he's talking he, He's talking across the racial divide, and is talking much more about the class divide, and about how these issues unite all of us. But, he, you know, he's got a very small pulpit. It's not a mass movement tied to the creation of a political identity. In fact, both, uh, I think, left elites and right elites are afraid of a class-based identity. So when you, when you look at that, you have to ask the question, where does mobilization come from? And it comes from a mix of institutions and identities. But I think that identity has to transcend class and unite across racial lines. And we don't have that kind of politics right now. I had a follow-up on that, which is, you know, um, you see this in large parts of Northern Europe, where the identity question is implicated in the question of public goods. Mm -hmm. right? and, yeah, and you exactly. Can, and you can make an argument that in some ways inclusive universal public goods create the public in large abstract societies, large mass societies. The United States hasn't had that, and certainly poor countries also have a challenge in developing low-income countries, middle-income countries even sort of face some of these challenges. So in situations like that where identity sort of gets activated because there is the countervailing force of public goods around which we can triangulate, mm -hmm. we face a challenge. How do we overcome this chicken and egg question? That's a, you know we're all we're all looking for that answer. I think that's a very important question. I will say, um, you know, I myself have thought, and this is not a it's one lever. It would be great to have a national service program in the United States, uh, a mandatory national service program that brings people from different walks of life together, um, and puts them in, you know, other, you know, meet, getting them to meet with people they would not normally meet um, and spend a year or two years together doing something to create a public good. You know, whether it's, you know, again, like the uh, building roads or infrastructure or uh, working, you know, again, in tandem with labor to, um, you know, create more uh, important public goods and get people thinking more about themselves as members of a community. That's one piece. And again, I do think the segmentation in society, the segregation and segmentation is a big obstacle because lots of people don't have a conception of a of a public good, they have a conception of their own good or their good for their, you know, family and uh, and their, uh, you know, their friends, and that's fine as far as it goes. But it's obviously not a uh, enough for a complicated uh, society that's facing major, huge problems. So one way is to try to build a sense of a public, but I you know, our institutions don't work so well. And so trying to 
and inequality is part of what's making our institutions work less well. And so, of course, like we need to tackle that problem if we want to improve, you know, politics, labor. You know, we've we've got to deal with the fact that money um, has flowed everywhere um, and uh, has really weakened. Uh, the ability of a lot of our institutions to deliver public goods. If I can comment on that, uh, Lisa's question, local politics, it, 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 what's happening is the reverse. Local politics is being co-opted by these national forces. So for example, my local school board election uh, that's coming up recently, I mean, the Tea Party, what used to be the Tea Party activists are much more organized on the ground in local elections because they're getting money from the Koch brothers and from other groups that are interested in this than the left has been. Um, and so, you know, rather than local politics being a source of strength, local politics has been a source of, um, you know, it's the opposite. The nationalization of local politics reflects the amount of money being spent. But to sort of um, tie touch on that and to push back a little, there are, uh, what do you think of efforts like in places like Seattle or Philadelphia, which, which uh, do advance things like a local minimum wage or more interestingly, even uh, more ambitiously things like uh, portable benefits for domestic workers. Um, so these experiments at the local level as, mm -hmm. uh, as, as sort of uh, not simply a laboratory for replication, although that as well, but as sort of a as sort of a, a, a space where where we can manage in a divided society. Well, my <laughs> my kind of uh, you know I, I I lived in California for twenty years, and um, you know when I went out there uh, originally, you know my local community would vote down every school bond measure. And by the time I left in 2007, uh, at least at the state level, anything that was pro-education involved spending money for education would get passed. And it was an incredible transformation of the politics of the state. I mean, you know, California gave us Ronald Reagan. It gave us uh, Prop 13 and cutting taxes. It, it gave us a conservative politics that was a backlash. And then the state changed. And I think we have to think of it that way. I think of local experiments as creating, you know, the off-the-shelf policies we need to implement the moment there is national power. And I think that's true on a global basis. You can experiment with guaranteed income, for example, in Stockton. Uh, I think that's being quite successful. Colorado had, um, you know, uh, basically free contraception for every 18-year-old. Uh, it, it, and, and had very positive results as a result of uh, private a uh, uh, funding which the state embraced to experiment with things. And so we have these models out there of what works. But when you ask what's wrong with American politics, the thing that just skews everything is the fact that, uh, as uh, Richard Florida calls it, the creative classes, the well-off, upwardly mobile, well-educated groups are heavily concentrated in selected urban areas and coasts. Uh, and the hinterlands are dying on the vine. And the worse off they are, the more conservative they become and the more pernicious their politics and the more open they are to conspiracy theories and because of the electoral college and because of redistricting and because the whole American political system is geographically skewed, what you're getting is a really pernicious politics of reaction. And what you need instead is a national politics. But to get that, you've got to overcome um, the redistribution of people into concentrated urban areas that have become increasingly liberal, but also have provoked backlash. I mean, North Carolina ought to be a solidly democratic state because of the in-migration. Same thing with Texas, but aren't because of the backlash against the in-migration that has increased the divisions in those states. And it's like a dam, you know, you're, you're holding it off, you're holding it off, you're holding it off. And then it lets go and it's going to sweep everybody away. That happened in California. Prop 187, the anti-immigration um, proposition, is what made California a solidly democratic state. 
it's here the immigrant <laughs> and the people who are the children of immigrants registered to vote and are solidly democratic today in a way they weren't before 1987. So when you look at that, that's what's going to happen. And the question is whether it happens before we have a complete disaster or only afterwards. Myrtle, are you back? You take a note. Um, if anyone has any more questions uh, in the chat, I'm uh, also <laughs> It's like I'm having a lot of problems <laughs> from, from in South Africa, but that's not unusual. I think basically, you know, I think uh, I've also learned a lot tonight from the other two speakers. I also listened a lot, but I think that, that the, the, the real uh, problem that we have is it's a, it's a change of society thinking. It's a change of how they think about um, uh, maybe the vulnerable sector of workers or maybe of the value of that that workers is adding, you know, to to the to society. And I think basically, uh, if we can if we can actually get governments to like before, at right, one stage I was saying that they they make labor laws, yes, because we ask for labor laws, we're asking them, we say, please, can you give us labor? But then they they don't have the humanity in that labor laws. They they. They precisely just making telling us, okay, you want labor laws? You want domestic workers to be recognized? Fine, here it is. Take it or leave it. But there's no humanity in it. There's no way they're going to actually sit down and, and, and discuss it with you and say, now, okay, how do we add value to the life of domestic workers? How do we make sure that this this labor law that we bring to you is actually going to help domestic workers. If we look at the situation, what happened in South Africa, we had to actually take our labor managers to court. We have to take it to court to actually say to him, the constitution is unconstitutional because it doesn't give domestic workers protection. But why did we have to do it? It's again show you that, and especially because we are women, black women, migrant workers, it doesn't seem that our voices is strong enough or maybe because we women. And I think that is what we have to achieve on all these panels. We have to achieve and we made to make sure that all the basic needs is there and that the recognition is there. We are moving on to, uh, you know, decent work campaign. We've been fighting for this for years and years. We've been talking panels after panels. We're going to the UN women, we talk, but, but we're just talking. So basically for me, the challenge is how do we actually remove the stigma of domestic work and see the value? And how do we ensure that what's happening inside of that huge walls where domestic workers are unprotected, that that will become a reality and a domestic worker will feel great. And that, that is what we see in the way forward is that it, to dignify domestic work, to make us part of the economy, to say that yes, you did add value to the economy. And for the employer to turn around and say, you know, because of you, I built a big business out there, and now I need to give you recognition for that. And that, that is what I see, that the change of the mindset of the employees, the change of the value of, of, of the basic workers, and also, yes, to recognize I need housing, security, education, all that must not become just something, it must belong to us. We have to have that. And that is what I see for the future of domestic workers and vulnerable workers. As, like I said before, we want what you have, and that's it. So Myrtle, on that point, someone asked a question in the chat, which is how can activists elsewhere, especially in the Europe and the US, um, help support your efforts to improve the working conditions and lives of domestic workers worldwide. Myrtle, did we lose? Yeah, I, I think it is the, the, the actual fact of the recognition. It, it, it is, it is, that is the, the most, the, the most important part it's the recognition. It's the recognition of 
domestic workers. And, and, and that is the burning point in my life. The burning point that I've been fighting for 50 years is the recognition, is the recognition of we are doing a job. And we are doing a job and that is worth to be called part of the labor and, and to be to, to get compensated for that job. And that is, is and of course, the, the, the biggest part that's missing in domestic is social protection. There is just no social protection for domestic workers. And like Deborah and June were saying, there is no social protection. And isn't that a right? Isn't that a right for us? Yes, and social protection is our right. It, 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 it must be there for us. And why do you always have to, to have a big fight, a campaign about this? And this is what I would like to see. I would like to see that social protection benefit and the recognition it's there for the next years to follow for domestic workers. And of course, a minimum wage brings us down on the bottom again. If it's a minimum wage, it must become a basic living wage because a, a minimum wage is pushing us back to poverty all the time. It's not moving us forward because it's a basic minimum wage that's not doing anything to our life. And you imagine a migrant worker coming to work for a basic minimum wage. She effectively worked for nothing. And, and that is that is what I would like to see the right social protection, social security, housing, everything that everybody else has, I would like to see that become a reality. And when they say, like, uh, uh, as to, to move away from not recognition, to move away with our work is valuable. Thank you, Myrtle. Um, that brings us to a close. I think it's kind of telling that we have wound up focusing very much on the role of social power, of, of, of those especially in need, but of large, of the, the history of, the, of democracy in many ways is also a history of the labor movement, just as the history of the welfare state is also a history of the labor movement. And I don't think it's an accident that we wound up centering so much on it in many ways. Um, I wanted to thank our speakers and I wanted to thank the organizers and um, for a very fascinating this set of discussions and presentations and uh, looking forward to seeing any of you in subsequent panels and sessions. Thank you.